Uh, well, good evening. Good evening. My name is Ian Whitaker. On behalf of the Council, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, please know that we're on the record tonight. We're live streaming. Um, please silence, silence your phones before we begin. Um, for nearly a century, the Council has provided an independent, non-partisan platform for a variety of different voices to promote a deeper global understanding uh, and active US engagement in the world. Views expressed by individual, individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions of the Council. Uh, thank you to our members in attendance tonight. Your support is critical to our work. Uh, if you're not a member, please consider joining. We have a wide range of levels for, for you to choose from. Um, later, we'll take questions from microphones in the room. You can also submit a question online. Just go to your browser and type chi.cnf.io, and you'll see that on our screens as well. Uh, the Council would like to thank Freedom House for partnering on this evening's program. I hope you picked up a copy of their, their report, Freedom in the World 2018, when you arrived this evening. Um, and finally, a few words about our speakers tonight. Uh, Michael Abramowitz is the president of Freedom House. He's a former director of the US Holocaust Museum's Levine Center for Holocaust Education. He was also previously a national editor and White House correspondent for the Washington Post. Jeremy Rosner is a partner at global polling and political consulting firm, uh, Greenberg Quinlan Rosner Research. He advises leaders, governments, corporations, and NGOs around the world on political strategy. He's also formerly a senior staff member on the Clinton administration's National Security Council. And our moderator, Susan Glasser, is Chief International Affairs Columnist at Politico. She's also host of the new weekly podcast, The Global Politico. Um, and prior to Politico, Susan was editor, editor in chief at Foreign Policy. Um, I'll return to moderate Q&A, but for now, please join me in welcoming our panelists. Well, thank you, Ian, uh, and thank you, Evo, and thank you uh, to everyone here for sharing this uh, cold evening. I'm, I'm always blown away by the uh, incredible audiences that you're able to get here on a, on a chilly weeknight. So thank you, uh, and to Mike and Jeremy. Uh, I'm hearing, yes, it's Chicago. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Um, you know, I was rereading this incredible report, copies of which are, are out here from Freedom House. And every year, you know, it's, it's a big event when this report is released. And, you know, I remember, I think I actually moderated the rollout of uh, this, I want to say, about, about 10 years ago. And it was maybe a year or two into the beginnings of this slide in democracy. 12 years in a row, uh, you know, we're talking about a decline in democracy found by Freedom House. And you know, this is, as they say in polling, outside the margin of error. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, when it was one year or two, you could say, well, uh, it's on the margins. And you know, so Mike, I know you'll share some of the big picture findings with us, but I wanted to jump in tonight right to this, this more high altitude question, which is, you know, wh what is going on in the world? I mean, you know, it's not all Donald Trump's fault, right? I mean, this is 12 years in a row. It has nothing to do, in fact, with, with Donald Trump. Right. So, well, first of all, I want to thank the council uh, for, for partnering with Freedom House on this event. Uh, and thank you to really uh, two very dear friends, Jeremy and Susan, for joining me on this panel. Uh, full disclosure, Susan was my editor <laughs> at, at one point, and, uh, and also I was the partner of her husband, Peter, uh, covering the White House. And Jeremy and I are, are working on a project together, which we'll talk a little bit about. I just want to say one quick word about Freedom House, because uh, we've actually been around for 77 years. And uh, uh, we've been working on the promotion and championing US leadership on democracy for, for 76, 77 years. So this is not new for us. I think uh, for a variety of reasons which uh, don't need to be explained, there is an incredible appetite for a discussion and interest in democracy this year. Uh, but I think we have been tracking this problem for, uh, for uh, as, as Susan said, uh, uh, for about 50 years. Our Freedom in the World project has been coming out every January since 1972. And I would just say maybe three quick takeaways from the report this year uh, and to try to get at your question. I think, uh, I think number one, we really do see democracy uh, under threat uh, all over the world. This is the 12th consecutive year that we have seen more countries experiencing a, a decline in political rights and civil liberties than, uh, than those countries that are having an improvement. Uh, and, and by the way, just for some context, uh, 
roughly 50% of the world's 7.8 billion uh, population lives in a country that we consider either partially free or not free. So I think that really says a lot about the amount of work we have to do. I think uh, the second thing that I think is kind of noteworthy this year is that you have really very important and influential countries that are, that are backsliding in significant ways. And I would just cite three countries as an example. I think exhibit A would be Turkey. This is a country that uh, really about 10 years ago was sort of a, a lively democracy with a lively media, lively, not, not perfect, but you know, was sort of on its way to possibly becoming part of the European Union. And it's really reverted to a highly authoritarian state. Uh, the numbers of uh, journalists and civil society people who are in jail in Turkey is really mind boggling. And, and it's really a sad story. So for the first time uh, ever in our report, Turkey, actually not the first time ever, but in a long time, Turkey moved from partially free to not free in our standards. Another country that uh, we could talk about would be Poland. Uh, Poland has been slipping. It's still a free country, but the attacks on uh, uh, the independent judiciary, the attacks on the media have really taken a toll on the health of democracy in Poland. And then another country which I think has not gotten probably as much attention as it should be would be Venezuela. This is a country that, uh, again, 12 years ago was a, was a functioning democracy. And over the years, uh, democracy has really uh, um, uh, declined uh, in a significant way, and uh, it's really function it's a, it's a military dictatorship now. Um, and I think the, the, the final thing I would just say, and we can talk more about this, I do think the role of the United States uh, is an interesting one and one that's worth having a discussion about. I mean, I think historically, uh, for all its faults, the United States has really been seen as a champion of democracy, uh, both uh, in terms of the practice of democracy, but also as a promoter of democracy. And, and I think we, we feel at Freedom House that we're getting away from that. And I think, as you say, Susan, it did not start on January uh, 20th, uh, 2017, but, it, uh, but, but we've been concerned about the erosion of democratic standards in, in the United States for quite some time. And I think the fact that there is this kind of anti-democratic uh, push around the world and the United States is kind of stepping back from the fray is something that is of deep concern to us at Freedom House. Well, you know, the, the statistics, as you sketch them out, are pretty alarming. I guess where I'd love to start with Jeremy is on the question of what is happening in the publics in these countries that is enabling this in some way. Uh, you know, this is uh, at the same time you're registering what's happening in these societies. There are also polls that suggest that support for uh, democracy and democratic institutions has gone down uh, not only in uh, less free countries, but even in Western democracies, including the United States. So, you know, what can you tell us that sheds any light on uh, why we're seeing this trend across so many different countries? Well, thank you, Susan. It's great to be with both of you, and it's great to be with the Chicago Council and with my old friend Ivo Dalder. The Chicago Council couldn't have better leadership, one of the best, toughest, smartest minds in American foreign policy. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think this question is the single biggest and most important question facing the world right now. There is no more central question than the health of liberal democracy because everything else we care about, whether it's the prevention of war or combating global warming or improving human well-being around the world, depends on the success of liberal democratic institutions taking hold, thriving, expanding. So this is, there couldn't be a more important question. And, you know, and, and my compliments to, to Freedom House, who do such a great job at tracking these trends over so many years. You know, I, I have the vantage point of seeing this from the campaigns on the ground. And everywhere we go, you know, we see the same things that, that Michael's talking about, um, the weaponization of the internet, the, the rise of, of sort of, you know, backlashes against uh, globalization, tribal reactions, uh, suppression of the media. Uh, and it's very, it's very disturbing. And generally, I think three things are driving this more than an erosion of public support. In some places, there's been an erosion of public support for the concepts of democracy, but it's actually pretty limited. And in the United States in particular, there's some at the very margins, but almost none uh, in, in recent years. 
more, I think it's three factors. One is, you know, uh, this backlash against globalization, against the e expanding and accelerating flows of, of people, of ideas, of cosmopolitanism, uh, mixing of cultures, which has led to this backlash and reversion to tribalism. A second is that the, I think the increased value of what countries do in monetary terms has heightened the, the incentives for very rich people to try to achieve state capture both in their own countries and investing in other countries, mm. the Mercers and, the, and, and the, other, the Cokes and others we could talk about, and this exists in other countries as well. And third is I think the forces of illiberalism have proved to be faster and smarter in the new technologies of communication uh, than the liberal Democrats. And, and in the same way that Russia succeeded in launching hybrid warfare with little green men out on the battlefield, they and others have succeeded in launching little green voices and hybrid politics with bots and trolls and these armies of people in back rooms trying to shape the public understanding in ways that are all but invisible, siloed, not disclosed, like other kinds of advertising would be. And, and so I think those three factors are what we see all around the world, more than the public moving away from idea, you know, from, from attachment to ideas of freedom. You know, it, it's, it's important, others have said this, but you know, we haven't reached the end of history, but there really isn't some alternative system that people are glomming onto. There are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of dictators who claim to be Democrats, but there are no Democrats who claim to be dictators. Um, democracy is the dominant idea. There's sort of a narrowing of history, if not the end of history. And now it's just a, an argument between sort of liberal and illiberal forms of democracy, or at least claims to one or the other. Uh, so it, it's not that democracy has been tarnished. No other system has really proved to produce better results. But the, the shock waves as people reacted to trade, migration, starting with Syria and, and spreading in many other ways, it just is, it is something we see all over the world. Can I, that's a very interesting argument, and can I challenge you a little bit on that when it comes to, I would say both Russia and China arguably have presented themselves as alternatives to democracy. I mean, Vladimir Putin from the beginning of his tenure, in fact, has said, uh, you know, democracy is a discredited word, uh, and in, in Russia today, it's associated with the disruption or the turmoil, the chaos of the 1990s, as opposed to the more positive associations we might have with it. I, you know, it was just a year ago that Xi Jinping was greeted rapturously uh, by the oligarchs in, in Davos and basically said, we offer an alternative path of development and one that uh, might promise more stability and uh, better results. So, you know, I, I don't know that the argument has been won or not, and you might say that, well, they don't have any real adherence or that's just a pointless uh, thing, but I, certainly they've claimed to present themselves as a global alternatives to the U.S. when it comes to democracy. For sure with China, it's, it's notable that Russia right now is trying to at least stage manage something that looks like a, an election. So that although Putin you know, is dismissive of democracy, he feels the need to stage something that looks like a democratic process, even though it's obviously not a democratic process. So I, you know, and, and you see very few countries trying to imitate China's way of running things uh, in, in the way that countries lined up to try to follow the Russian Revolution in, in the earliest earlier part of the last century. So uh, I'm not, you know, there are those who dismiss the Western model of liberal democracy, but I'm not sure that there's a coherent alternative that people are, are really flocking to in the way that, you know, people had to push back against communism or fascism in the last century. Mm -hmm. No, I would, uh, what you said, Susan, uh, resonates with me. You know, uh, I've been in this job now for just about a year, and I have been struck that things that I thought would be kind of just obvious uh, need to be kind of defended. You know, one of the things that happens when you're the president of Freedom House is you have countries come to you and complain about their scores, <laughs> right? And 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 I and I'm, I'm it, 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 it actually it's a sign that we're doing our job that, 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 that yeah. they complain about our, about our scores and, and actually like. The first week I was on the job, I had the foreign minister of Ukraine came to see me, and he was upset about 
an element of, of our scoring. But uh, I, I was struck that we had in my office uh, a couple months ago uh, a cabinet minister from a uh, from a you know from a successful economically Asian country, and he really was quite forceful in pushing back that the that the ideas and the ideals which we monitor in Freedom House uh, are are really. Uh, uh, global and universal values. I mean, we do feel that freedom of expression and freedom of association, these are, uh, these are, we think these are universal aspirations and what's really inspiring about being at Freedom House is, is working with activists on the ground who, in spite of all these pressures, you know, are fighting for these values. But I don't, I don't think we can take it for granted that, that people around the world accept that. And the other thing I would say, and obviously, Susan, you're much more of an expert on Russia than I am, but I think what's interesting is just the, I mean, I think one of the dynamics now in, 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 in kind of the battle over d democracy and freedom is just the really aggressive efforts that both Russia and China are making. I mean, Putin really is an enemy of democracy. And you know what, what happened in the 2016 uh, presidential election in our own country is happening in other parts of the world, in Ukraine, in the Baltics. Uh, and, and also, Xi Jinping, as you said, uh, has really held out you know, this Chinese model of kind of authoritarian capitalism as, as a model uh, for the rest of the world. I'm not sure it's particularly attractive, and we'll see in the long run whether it's going to work. But I, I do think that we have our work cut out for us, for those of us who really believe in these values, that, 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 that this is the way to go. I don't think it's, a, an, I don't think it's a obvious argument for as many people as we think it is. Well, let's talk about the, uh, you know, the American elephant in the room, as it were, uh, and, you know, what role uh, you mentioned that democracy promotion uh, has more or less been abandoned now as, as a tool of American foreign policy. What, if anything, do you think are the consequences of that? That you know, is that already showing up in the index? Uh, it, will it be a lagging indicator? You know, will we see uh, the consequences of President Trump and Secretary of State Tillerson's lack of uh, you know real interest? They, they do not talk about democracy and, and human rights in the way that previous leaders in, in both parties tended to. What do you both think about uh, the role of this as an element of America's uh, leadership in the world, and what will it mean if, it, if it's gone? Will that affect the uh, standings even more? Well, I, I would say I think it's important to distinguish between two issues with respect to America. Uh, one is uh, the role that the promotion of democracy plays in our foreign policy, right. and also just the strength of American democracy. And I happen to believe that you know, historically speaking, in the grand sweep of things, especially if you're looking, you know, after the after World War II, that one of the strengths of American soft power was that we had a very strong and vibrant democratic system, not without its flaws, you know, and not without uh, uh, problems. But I think that uh, it, it, I think it was inspiring uh, to the, to the people that we had the First Amendment, and that and that and that we had a strong commitment, I'm a former journalist, to you know, to freedom of expression. And so I do think it's a problem, uh, and, 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 I, and I, I don't say this from a partisan point of view because I think at Freedom House we were critical of previous administrations for other elements of things, but the fact that the President of the United States is so critical of the news media and so focused on uh, uh, really branding as fake news, you know, anything that he disagrees with, I think that's having a huge and deleterious you know, impact, uh, it, it's, 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 it's impossible for us to speak with candor to other countries about their concerns about throwing journalists in jail when this is happening. We at Freedom House work with, with you know, thousands of activists around the world uh, who work on the front lines of freedom. And I can tell you they are looking at what's happening in the United States right now. And I think we have a hard time really you know, telling them what to do. You know, given what's happening in our country, even though I think what's happening in our country is different than, I mean, it's not as bad as what's happening in Turkey or Russia. I mean, I mean, we got to be free. We got to be. Our country is still a very robust democracy, but I think it really limits our, our soft power. Mm -hmm. Do you see specific consequences so far from uh, Trump in the global democracy space? Well, sure. I mean, first of all, every country I go to, I'm sure it's true with both of you as well. The first question is, you know. What the hell's going on? You know, people shake their heads. Um, I think I, I'd concur with m what Mike said. So it's both programmatic and in terms of the example that's set. Uh, I, you know, what's going on programmatically reminds me of the 
the moments you know, in, in the late 1940s when the British sent a telegram to the State Department saying they could no longer afford to finance the support of the Balkan states. Mm -hmm. And you know, we suddenly had to take over, and that led to the Truman Doctrine. I see you know, signs all over the world of the withdrawal of US leadership funding and people in sort of the same way, you know, other countries having to take up the burden of funding, whether it's DFID in Britain having to fund projects that NDI used to run, you know, funded by the State Department that now no longer have funding. And, and so uh, you're having to rely on non-American funding for the promotion of democracy, but also very much in, in the example that's being set. I think what'll be really important are the two 2018 and 2020 elections. Uh, the, the sense I get is people know that this election was decided by less than 45,000 votes in three Midwestern states, and, and they're willing to entertain the notion that it was a bit fluky and maybe pushed over the edge by Russian interference. But if it's validated in 2018 or 2020, then I think that's going to lead to a, a real un further undermining in a real significant way of people's faith in in, in our democratic example. Well, of course, that's where uh, this bigger picture offered by the, the Freedom House Index suggests that it, that it wasn't a one-off. Uh, whatever the results are, we, we all know at this point that uh, the kinds of uh, populist assaults on uh, institutions of democracy, the eroding uh, of uh, democracy in places that after the Cold War uh, were seen to be moving in one direction. You know, these aren't happening in isolation. Uh, and I think, to me, that's, that's the question that I have for Mike, actually, is what um, do you see this is such a macro trend, right? You know, it clearly, while there are individual specificities, you talked about Poland, Poland's not the same as Turkey. What, in your view, are some of the characteristics that are operating at all of these places? Is it uh, because it's a generation after the end of the Cold War uh, and, uh, you know, that sort of war of ideas is finally sort of faded from our collective uh, political memory? I mean, what, what is driving it at this big picture level to have 12 straight years of decline across the board? Well, this is a the $64 million question, and <laughs> you, you get a lot of different answers uh, from people. But I, I, I tend to think about two or three major causal factors or things that I think about. Uh, one, obviously, is the economic dislocation. Uh, you know, it's not, uh, to me, it's not particularly... Uh, surprising that the beginning of this so-called democratic recession or democracy recession really coincided, I think, with the economic dislocations of the aughts. And I think that, I think we have to, for those of us who are fervent defenders of democracy, I think we have to acknowledge that for, for many people around the world, it's not just uh, steel workers in the Rust Belt, but it's, uh, you know, farmers in Poland or uh, or others that 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 there is a feeling that uh, democracy did not always deliver uh, on what is really a central promise, which is that prosperity and that and, and that a, 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 a fairly distributed uh, a level of benefits uh, for society. So I, I definitely think that uh, the economic factors are something uh, that we need to consider, and I also think uh, you know the world migration crisis. Is, is has to be a factor. I mean, if you think of, if you, I mean, that's that's a common element really to a lot of the countries that we're talking about, where we have now, I believe this is correct, the 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 largest number of, of displaced people since World War II, mm -hmm. and and this is creating a huge consternation in in, in in electorates and populations, not just in America, but in but in Europe, obviously in Hungary and. In, in Poland, in France, in uh, in Germany, and I think that this is, you know, fueling uh, a certain rise of uh, a type of nationalism, populism, that has the potential uh, to be really bad news for those who care about core liberties. Jeremy, do you think that we, to be blunt, screwed it up in any way? I mean, is it, how much is there uh, some American agency or even culpability in any of this? Is this uh, is this a backlash in some way to uh, the Iraq war and perceived nation building? Is it a miscalculation by uh, the Clinton administration going back to the very beginning uh, of that post-Cold War age? What, what role does America play in this democracy deficit? Right. So I, it's a great question, I, you know, and I don't know. Um, 
I, I tend to think that this is less something that we, the United States, screwed up and more something that we people around the world who believe in liberal democracy screwed up. One thing I see a lot of around the world is a lot of established you know, centrist, center-right, center-left political parties who got awfully complacent and awfully lazy in their roles as gatekeepers on keeping the crazies out, in their roles as needing to stay in touch with average people and their frustrations, in their roles on fighting against corruption. And I think in Europe, you know, and, and certainly Latin America, the Odebrecht scandal, massive scale. Uh, you know, one thing people are upset about all over the world is they think they're getting ripped off, and in general, they're right. And the, you know, so I think a lot of leaders did too little to push back against corruption. And what we see in the Panama Papers and the Paris Papers is is great evidence of that. Too little to reform and update their parties, too little to focus on the needs of the people in their countries rather than their own political needs. You know, I, Poland's an interesting case. I mean, Poland, you know, although I, I very much agree that the Great Recession drove a lot, you know, in the financial ripples, drove a lot of the, the frustrations and the move to populism, you know, Poland was virtually exempt from the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. That's right. And and I do think one of the points you made, it, it nags at me, as Ambassador Dalder knows. I was in, involved in the effort to enlarge NATO and the, bring the first three countries, the Poles and the Czechs and the Hungarians in. And it, it's notable to me, and it haunts me, that those three are among the Central European countries furthest off the reservation in terms of liberal democracy. They've mm -hmm. gone furthest off course. And I do think there's a certain amount that when countries are, feel safe, that it creates a little space for irresponsible voices. And I, I, you know, it's not an iron rule, and there's certainly irresponsible voices like Joe McCarthy during a time of perceived danger. But I, I do worry that that's, uh, that that may have been a role, that may have played a role in it. Hmm, that's so interesting. Uh, well, of course, it certainly has played a role in Vladimir Putin's narrative around one of the reasons for uh, 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 what he has done to lead Russia away from uh, uh, our notion of liberal democracy. He's, he's recreated basically a Soviet narrative of encirclement around that, that NATO expansion. Well, I, I'm, I'm still a partisan it's of, your the, fault. of the idea. <laughs> and I think, that's, you know, I think that's a narrative he's built that is separate from the facts. I mean, I think he, his designs to reconstitute the Russian Empire were evident apart from and before NATO enlargement. But, so I don't think that played a role in that, um, despite his claims that that's what's a role. But I, but I, you know, I was struck, I'll just tell a little story. In, in Estonia, working with a party there on election when uh, Russia rolled into Crimea. Mm -hmm. And you know, the party I was working with said, boy, we'd better you know, run the whole campaign on security. And I said, well, we've got focus groups tonight. Let's check it out. And the focus groups, we said, well, what's on your mind? And they talked about you know, housing and wages and unemployment and corruption. Nobody mentioned Crimea. And finally, we prompted them. We said, you worried about this? They said, oh, no. We're we said, NATO. how come? We're in NATO. You know, so I, I worry about these countries feeling perhaps a little too secure. Well, it's really, I'm glad you brought up security because, Mike, uh, you know, it, generally these conversations don't talk that much about that, right? Generally talk about uh, economics, globalization, is it a backlash, technology disruption. Uh, those tend to be uh, what you hear more uh, in the democracy conversation. Do you think security is, is, is often missing from that, or do you agree with Jeremy's uh, thesis here? You have to think about that a little bit. I mean, I certainly feel that the refugee crisis, which I was talking about, right. you know, makes it, people feel insecure. It's part of the in, it's part of the security. Uh, I think there's no question that uh, that people you know feel less secure, whether rightly or wrongly, because of that. And I think and I think the threat of terrorism obviously has made uh, uh, people feel less secure. I mean, I think we have to recognize that you know in the in the you know, in the aftermath of 9-11, you know, there were a lot of things, you know, done in this country uh, that, you know, arguably were infringement on, on liberty uh, in defense of, uh, in defense of um, uh, security. So, yeah, I, I, I basically think 
that security is a factor in, in those two in those two direct ways. Interesting. Well, by the way, we're going to bring in the audience soon for questions, so get them ready. Uh, just quickly before we do, let's let's go back and be specific uh, for for a couple of minutes. Uh, you know, if you look at the bottom performers oh. in your index, uh, I noticed that you have Syria. Uh, as the very worst, even more than North Korea. Presumably that's because there's an active civil war there. Uh, are there common attributes uh, to the worst of the worst? Are they getting worse or the downward trend really has to do with middle countries like Turkey sort of going in one direction or the other? Uh, I think the trend has mainly to do with those middle countries. I and mean, I think that, you know, every year we publish, uh, you know, like the 10 worst, you know, the worst of the worst. And I mean, look, they don't have free elections. <laughs> they throw political opposition into jail. Uh, actually, corruption, I think, is a big issue. Uh, I think in, in, in countries that are not democratic, uh, uh, I think corruption is a big issue. And I think also corruption is like a leading indicator mm -hmm. of, 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 of countries that are you know, uh, maybe doing somewhat well. But if you're worried about you know, a country that might slide into authoritarianism, I think corruption is, is a good leading indicator. Um, by the way, just on the flip side of that, uh, uh, the, the, the Scandinavian countries t tend to do uh, the best in terms, of, in terms of our scores. So I think Finland, Sweden, and Denmark are sort of at the top of the list this year. And uh, uh, so that's, uh, those, that's the good and the bad. Well, you know, President Trump said that Sweden was a hellhole, right? But uh, <laughs> it's not yet been proven. Uh, it's not yet been proven. Jeremy, when you go around the world and you're working in these countries, are there warning s signals that you see? I, you were nodding your head pretty vigorously around this corruption uh, issue. Uh, is that always, in your view, associated with uh, a, a bad political trend? Yeah, I, I think corruption is one of the most <laughs> underappreciated issues on the planet. And the disjunction between what average voters and members of the public talk about in countries all over the world and what gets discussed in policy circles, on that, the disjunction on that issue is extreme. Um, and so I do think that's a leading indicator. And I think it's, it's not an irrational issue at all. I mean, it's, it's not a moral issue. It's not about people not following the rules. It's about significant portions of people's GDP disappearing into people's pockets. And, and uh, you know, I mean, it's not by accident that Vladimir Putin is now the richest person on the planet by a lot of accounts. Um, so I think that's... Uh, he said he only makes $670,000 yeah. a year. <laughs> I, I, last I saw it was $140 billion stashed away. Um, you, would, you would know better. Um, well, but, but the, your point is well taken. And when, when my husband and I were based there during uh, Vladimir Putin's first term in office, and so there were still these you know, institutions of democracy that you know, he was in the process of reconsolidating power. But when we came back from Russia, uh, you know, I think what we felt was that the, our, our failure as correspondents was to find a way to write about the uh, overwhelming and toxic corruption uh, that people encountered in their everyday lives in Russia. And it's very, very hard. It defies a lot of the, you know, sort of our attributes of, you know, Western journalism, right? It's very hard to write about corruption, uh, especially when it's penetrated uh, the fabric in, in every which way, and it's become now almost inseparable with the actual government itself of Russia. And right. so that uh, makes it even harder in some ways uh, to write about in a meaningful way, to communicate also to people here in the United States where the system is so radically different. Uh, you know, it really, uh, it, it blows people's minds uh, because we're just not wired to even understand uh, a, a level of, you know, personalization of uh, profit-taking from the machinery of the state itself. I'm, I'm very struck in, in Ukraine, which is more of real democracy, but even there and even after Yanukovych being kicked out, you basically can't run for national office in Ukraine unless you've linked up with one of the oligarchs. And so that any of the voices who say, I'm going to not take a penny from the oligarchs, I'm going to be independent, and there are a lot of them, and they're, they're impressive people, they don't get hurt. They can't get access to me. They don't have the money to wage a competitive election. And so, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I really, I started my career at Common Cause. So there's a little bit of the good government uh, activist left in me. Um, I do believe that Citizens United here, 
the extreme flows of money into politics here, but also in other countries, uh, is really one of the three or four biggest factors to focus on. And it's very striking to me that the countries that Michael's talking about that are at the top of the list you know, are virtually without exception all countries that have very tight campaign finance rules, public financing of, of elections in many cases, and where money just doesn't slosh around the way it does in Ukraine or in the United States. And so I think that's a huge factor. So Mike, before we go to the audience, can you tell us something good? <laughs> <laughs> Well, there wasn't a lot of good news to report this year. I could tell you that Gabon and Ecuador were up substantially. But uh, uh, I'd say the one thing that uh, a positive news just in general is I do think that free and fair elections do have the potential to turn things around. And you know, two examples that I would cite, not just in the last year, but just more recently, would be Argentina and South Korea. You know, these were countries where uh, essentially you had governments that were corrupt, that were uh, illiberal in some ways, and essentially uh, there, was, there was elections and basically they were thrown out of power. And, and those countries are now on a better trajectory because of what happened with elections. So I think really the cornerstone of democracy uh, is having, you know, free and fair elections. And that's sort of part of the problem, you know, with what we're talking about in Russia. You know, there's going to be a charade in, 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 a, in a month. And it's not, you know, that basically, you know, the, the, the outcome was preordained, you know, I don't know when, maybe in 1999 or 2000, but basically, you know, there is going to be no serious opposition. And, and it'll be very interesting to see how uh, the world reacts to that, whether they congratulate, whether they call up, uh, you know, Vladimir Putin and congratulate him on that election. You know, there was a very powerful op-ed in the uh, Washington Post in the last week by Vladimir Karamurza, who's a very brave uh, uh, political uh, dissident uh, who has been, you know, I think, poisoned twice. Twice, yeah. Uh, uh, and he's still, he's, just a, he's a very strong uh, ally of Freedom House. And, uh, you know, he was really made a very uh, powerful call to, you know, for countries like the United States not to recognize, not to congratulate Putin, because that would be a farce. Well, I mean, again, this goes back to the, the elephant in the room issue of the United States and whether, uh, you know, our current situation obviously didn't trigger this uh, trend, but what effect it's going to have on it. You know, I'm thinking of President Trump uh, uh, congratulating Xi Jinping uh, on the results of his recent party congress and the consolidation, uh, by all accounts, of uh, his power inside uh, uh, the communist system there in a way that makes him the most powerful uh, leader of China in, in a couple decades. And so, uh, you know, that's not exactly what you would have expected from a U.S. president in the past. Right. Well, I, I feel, you know, just to be fair here, I think, I think there are a couple things that, you know, we would be concerned about with uh, the president. You know, one would be, as you say, this kind of praise of dictators, CC, Putin, calling Erdogan when he, uh, uh, the you referendum. Know, well, in the referendum. You know, on the other hand, I do think that, you know, there, there has been some good news from the administration in terms of some of these issues in recent, I mean, I think one thing that you know about, Susan, is this Global Magnitsky Act, mm -hmm. which was a very important piece of human rights legislation that was passed on a bipartisan basis uh, in, at the end of the Obama administration, which basically gives governments, uh, uh, that gives the U.S. government the, the, the authority to uh, sanction uh, gross human rights abusers, corrupt officials, and the Trump administration is using it. They sanctioned 50 or so uh, individuals uh, under Global Magnitsky. That's a good thing. And I also think, you know, the fact, uh, uh, I was very intrigued by, you know, General Mattis, uh, uh, the new national defense strategy, and really clearly identifying, you know, uh, the threat from Russia. As, as something that, that we need to take much more seriously. And I think that threat has to do in part with the challenge to democracy. So I think, I think that for those of us who really care about human rights and democracy, there are people in the administration that, that, can be, that we can work with. And I think uh, there can be progress made. I don't think, uh, I don't think it's an entirely bleak picture. Well, those are excellent points. And Jeremy, do you want to? I would just say the one thing I find encouraging, not to be Pollyannish about it at all, but democracy partly runs on memory. And people don't defend their freedom unless they remember in some form what it means to be unfree. Uh, 
And some of these illiberal leaders have triggered a reawakening and a remembering. And they have sort of an antioxidant uh, effect uh, on people's memories. Uh, with, you know, in the US, a lot's been written about. There are over 400 people, not to be too partisan, although I'm very partisan, you know, 400 people who have registered to be challengers on the Democratic side, more than, by far more than in any time in history. Uh, outpouring of people stepping forward in all forms of civic activism, really on both sides of the aisle. And we see this in other countries too, in Britain, after Brexit. And so th there is kind of a wake-up call uh, happening that you know I think has some potential to n not only get people active, but to revive the vibrancy of some of the mainline political parties, which had gone stagnant, um, media, um, and, and to trigger the sort of antibodies that will defend democracy. All right. Not necessarily Pollyannish, but uh, we'll see what the audience has to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, do we have a microphone? Uh, we do. Uh, here. So I'm going to go ahead right here in the front row. You get to go first. Yeah. Tell us your name, uh, and do try to make it a question so we can get to as many people. OK, I will. Um, my name is Nora Hayes. And so I just have a question about China. So since um, under Xi Jinping, and he published his uh, Xi Jinping thought in the Constitution, and seeing as they're on track to become the number one economy, do you perceive that there's any like imminent threats to that or to China's government or economy in the future? Uh, well, the problem of dealing with 200 different countries of rating freedom. I think on China, uh, you know, I've, I've heard, I've, I've, I'm of two minds of China. Uh, number one, a country that goes to the lengths that it does to uh, kind of control thought, you know, the so-called great, great firewall, which is, you know, millions of, uh, of basically censors who are trying to prevent the Chinese people from getting information uh, from the outside world or from people that may disagree. I mean, to me, in some ways, that's a sign of weakness. And uh, so while trends in China don't seem to me, from the point of view of freedom, don't seem to be auspicious, that seems like a, uh, uh, that seems to me a potentially a sign of weakness in the system. Uh, I think the flip side of that is, you know, China, unlike Russia, is a genuinely economically dynamic place, right? And it's had this huge growth. And now whether they can continue that growth uh, under a system that, you know, represses thought and, and free thinking, you know, I think is an open question. But I think China's economic dynamism uh, is, 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 is kind of putting the wind at its sails for a very aggressive foreign policy. And, 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 and I think really, uh, it's interesting, I happened to be, I was invited to the World Economic Forum at Davos this year, and one of the things that was quite interesting was just uh, 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 how China really was dominating the thought and the thinking of, of the world leaders. And I think, uh, I can tell you that challenging uh, China on, on freedom and democracy issues is not at the high, uh, is not at the high point for the, uh, for the world economic elite. So, I, I, I not a straight answer, but I see pros and cons to the situation. All right. Well, it's your counsel. <laughs> uh, thanks for a great discussion. Uh, Susan asked a question I wanted to ask you, Jeremy, but I'm going to, so I'm going to switch it around, which is this unfortunate coincidence that the three countries we pushed through uh, and NATO enlargement are also the three that are moving more quickly to an illiberal posture than we've seen, Czech, the, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and, and Poland. And it raises, in my mind, a larger question, which is how right were we in our strategy? And there are two parts to that strategy that were fundamental. One, the belief that, that we could somehow, whether it was through an enlargement process of NATO, or under the Bush administration, a military strategy, we, we could bring democracy to the rest of the world. We were so powerful. Uh, this was a unipolar moment. We were able to, to find a way to push this forward. And that secondly, economic liberalization would lead to political liberal, liberalization. The point uh, just that you, you talked about, Mike, with regard to both Russia and China. This belief that if you brought them into the market, 
that they would, over time, liberalize. And on both of those, we haven't quite succeeded. Uh, certainly in the Middle East, we haven't succeeded on the democratization uh, uh, part and, in, and, and with regard to China and other countries, Vietnam, um, we haven't succeeded in opening up the markets leading to a political liberalization. So that raises the question, did we have the right strategy? I mean, I agree with you that, that the end of history, that liberalism, that democracy is important, but how we bring that about in other countries the last 25 years are, a, are an interesting uh, uh, empirical uh, experiment in which we've had some success, particularly in the 90s, but since the 90s, a lot less. Great question. Uh, you will personally be the I, spokesperson uh, <laughs> for U.S. foreign policy for the last two decades. So, you know, as, as you know, there are a lot of different shades of policy and ideology within that set of, of views. You know, I think during the, the Clinton years, there was not a belief that we could you know, impose or bring democracy to these countries. There was a sense that there was a tide in that direction, and we could certainly support those aspirations where they were being pursued. NATO enlargement was demand driven. These were countries that, I mean, were, it was the top demand they were all, the top requests they were all making. Um, uh, starting, you know, in, in, in the very early 90s. Um, and so it wasn't something that we were trying to impose. Now I think there was, as you say, a somewhat different view under the Bush administration where it had more of a military flavor and and a different theory about what a military action could do with regard to establishing democratic governance. So I, I, I think I've always been very wary that we can impose democracy, that we can expand it as if it's something we're doing. I think it absolutely has to be demand driven on the ground. When it is demand driven, I think there's, you know, from my experience, with organizations like NDI and IRI and working on elections, there's an awful lot you can do to train party leaders, train people in civil society how to be more effective, give them some of the tools they need. But you sure, you know, it's a marginal difference. It's a marginal difference. And, and that marginal difference, I think, it gets swamped very easily by things like the Great Recession like new communications technologies. Well, I mean, I, I do think two places where we were wrong, you know, where a lot of people were wrong, was that economic liberalization would lead to political liberalization. Doesn't necessarily come true. Um, and second, that the internet would be a weapon for freedom. Um, in some ways, early on it was, but I think now it's more a weapon against freedom. Um, so I think those two premises were a little bit off. But I, I don't. You know, I don't think the premise is wrong, my own view, that, that people generally have a yearning for freedom and that where they are willing to stick their necks out and, and work for it and risk for it, that the United States and other liberal democracies can make a very significant difference by supporting it, not imposing it, not, guide, not guiding it, but being supportive. Okay, right here. You, uh, you all mentioned the refugee crisis and sort of the dis in sort of the lower class being feeling that they'd been left out. Why would you say that in some cases this has caused almost a backlash against democracy and democratic ideals? A good question, Mike. What's the connection between uh, the economics of it and why they would blame democracy for it? Well, I'm not sure they're blaming democracy, but I do think that uh, uh, the refugee crisis has, has really, I mean, I, mean, I mean, the way I think of it is I, I, I think that the refugee crisis, uh, you know, has really disrupted people's sense of security, people's sense of identity, uh, and I think the way I would put it is that I think it's created a kind of a fertile territory 
for demagogues and others to operate. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't think, I, I mean, I think that the, the, the people that we're talking about, this, you know, I, I think they believe in democracy and they believe, and I think as Jeremy very eloquently said, uh, I think that there's been a, a strong case that they have been really not well served by the economic policies of, 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 of different governments around the world. Uh, so, but, but I think it's really uh, that it's the creation of a fertile ground for, for, for demagogues that I think is, is, where I, is where I would be personally concerned. Jeremy, are there any uh, polls that, you know, or sort of numbers that you could share with us that shed any light on whether there is a connection between kind of the authoritarian impulse in, in these at least Western societies uh, and economics? I mean, you know, are they drawn from uh, disproportionately from one group or the other in society? So it's not uniform, but it's certainly the case over a lot of, you know, Western Europe and the U.S. that the that the change in the politics happened in a lot of cases with you know, older, downscale, more rural, less cosmopolitan voters. That was the case you know, in Pennsylvania. That was the case in Brexit. That was, you know, whereas younger, more cosmopolitan, urban um, citizens who live more amid the flows of globalization um, you know, are more comfortable with that. Um, so th there is some of that. I, I do think that, you know, getting the question, I, I just think democracy, and Mike said this, democracy ultimately, people don't buy into democracy because it's an elegant theory. They buy into democracy if it delivers the goods, if they feel their lives improve. It. Um, and, you know, in a lot of places in, in Latin America 10, 20 years ago, you know, there was the sense the Western, you know, Washington consensus neoliberal model just wasn't delivering the goods, and and people were right, and and that made the the soil fertile for things like Hugo Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution and Evo Morales, and and so I, I think there is this connection that those who now it's not always the case, you know, that that those who feel aggrieved are in the worst economic shape. Mm -hmm. And that's true in our country too, but but I think there is a connection, um, and, and especially relative to expectations. Okay. Uh, right there. Yeah, you. Hi. Thanks for a great discussion. I wanted to uh, get a little specific about something that Jeremy said. You said uh, when countries feel safe, it creates space for irresponsible voices, and I'm. If you acknowledge that, what's the response or strategy to tackle that concern that works within the standards of freedom and democracy? Boy, that's a great question. I, so, I, you know, I don't know. And, and I, I'd love to hear what other people think about that. I, I do, I'm, I'm fascinated by this idea of memory and, and what cultures have to do over long periods to keep the memory of insecurity and unfreedom alive in order to animate the impulse for people to take risks, take responsibility to protect their political institutions, their sovereignty, to keep another country from coming in and launching 500,000 bots against our uh, websites. Um, so so I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, that's a t I think that's a really tough question. Um, I mean, um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't have a good answer. It's a, it's a very tough trade-off. You don't want to artificially you know, sustain a sense of danger, you know, hype up the war on terrorism in order to pe keep people feeling like they need to. But it is a sense of, of you know, it's, um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Scandinavia is at the top of your list, right? You know, my guess is that they don't, have the highest fear factor uh, in the world. They don't, and they're also, you know, economically, I mean, they're also, you know, relatively homogeneous societies. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I, I think with respect to the United States, for instance, you know, I talk about this with some of my colleagues at Freedom House. I mean, I, I, I give the United States kind of a, a break sometimes because we're really, as a country, we're accommodating an incredible melting pot 
of, of, of diversity of different kinds of people and different uh, backgrounds. And so, you know, that's like an experiment that's really never been done elsewhere in the world. And so I think the fact that we still have a very thriving uh, democracy in many ways here with some concerns, I think, is a, is, 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 is a, is a very hopeful sign in some ways. I think she pointed to it's somebody okay. else. It's, it's, it's good. Okay. No, no, no. We're good. Um, uh, Alan Rich from Chicago. Um, and I, I'm cursed by traveling a great deal. Uh, talking about Scandinavia, first of all, uh, I had a most fascinating set of meetings in Copenhagen last November with leaders from both the People's Party and the Social Democrats. And they're deeply concerned about their identity right now. In fact, the, the uh, Danish Social Democrats are the first party, Social Democratic Party, that have come out saying we need to put limits on migration yeah. and immigration. Um, my, my question to you, though, is, is a little different. It goes back to the original conversation. Let's assume we had a fourth chair up, up here tonight. And that fourth chair was occupied by Henry Kissinger. And somebody was asking Kissinger what's happening with regard to, um, you know, the flow towards democracy or liberal democracy. Um, and would Kissinger be saying, really, what we're experiencing is a regression to the mean? That, what, you know, we, we tend to look at things through our Western liberal democratic eyes, but much of the world doesn't have the same cultural traditions. And therefore, the veneer of the 90s has just worn off in, in a number of societies. Let me just make two quick points. First of all, just on the Scandinavian countries, I actually just happened to be in Denmark and uh, Stockholm just for a day in each place. And I, I definitely think that while those countries are rating you know, very high in our, in our scores, uh, I think there's some tensions that are, that are coming to fore because of uh, immigration. You know, uh, uh, you know, in Sweden, also, you know, anti-Semitism in, in, in certain parts of, of Sweden. So I think, you know, uh, I would watch those scores in the next couple of years because I think, you know, there could be some changes. Um, on the issue of Henry Kissinger, what he would say, I have no idea what he would say. <laughs> the, one, the one thing, though, that I would say is, and I don't mean to kind of under, undercut my whole point, but I do think if you step back, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and you see this from people like Neil Ferguson and others, you know, the big picture is that compared to, it depends on the, on the time frame that you're talking about, that, you know, there are many more countries now that are democratic than were 70 years ago. And so I think in some ways the tide of history uh, is towards more democracy. I don't think there really is an alternative to democracy. As Churchill said, it's like uh, the worst form of government except for all the others. Uh, but I think, I just think we can't be Pollyannish about it. I think that the last 12 years have shown a really strong challenge uh, to democracy that needs to be met if we want to keep progress going in the right direction. So I'm not sure that answers exactly your question, but I do think that that, that there's a lot to be happy about if you look at now compared to, you know, 70 years ago. It's just, I, I just think the trends for the last 10 to 12 years are really bad. It partially answers it, but we can talk about it. Yes. <laughs> I don't know if you ever thought about what Henry no, Kissinger I, I, would say. I, I've never, <laughs> I've gotten this far in life without presuming to speak for Henry Kissinger. But I, I, uh, no, I very much agree with Mike. I think, the, you know, if, if you look in the very long term, um, then what's happened in the last 12 years looks more like what happened in the market on Monday than 2007 and, you know, a crash. Um, it's, it's sort of a market correction um, in the very long sweep of history. And I think, you know, I do believe in the, the idea that the arc of history inclines toward these ideas and institutions of freedom, and they become, I think it's incredibly true and powerful that there aren't really, you know, Democrats who claim to be dictators, but there are dictators who claim to be Democrats. I think it, it, it has become a dominant idea for lots of reasons. And, but, but uh, you know, there's lots of zigs and zags in the process, for sure. All right. I think we have time for just one final question. Uh, you, sir, right there. No, I, I'm, 
One of the cornerstones of our democracy is, is that we, we get to vote, and we're a representative democracy. And I want to ask you about gerrymandering. And I don't know if that goes on in other democracies. And, and a lot of people have, have said that, you know, this has led to a lot of our problems, the polarity of our two parties, nothing getting done in Washington, et cetera. So um, gerrymandering is a problem. There's been a lot of really great work done on this recently, um, aided by a lot of great computer models that show that gerrymandering is a part of why we're polarized, but it's, it's not even the dominant part. Um, and it certainly goes on in every country in some form. I mean, not, not, it's not always with drawing boundaries of districts, but you know, one of the wonderful privileges I have of mucking around in, in electoral systems all over the world is that every system has questions of the electoral process that are inherently politically decided as our boundaries on our congressional districts. And um, th there's really no escaping that. And that one, part of the results of the studies that have been done on alternatives to gerrymandering is that you know, you're, you're always making trade-offs between how competitive the districts are, how many different voices get heard and represented, and there's no ideal solution. In the same way, there's really no ideal solution on the different ways you aggregate votes on you know, proportional representation systems and lists and combined proportional representation constituency based. There's not an ideal. Um, and so I, I'm, I, I, you know, personally, I like the kind of Nebraska, California, nonpartisan system for deciding on boundaries, but I think it's a mistake. And, you know, and I admire the efforts that people like Eric Holder have done to try to move in that direction. I think it's a good impulse, but I think it's a very small piece of what's gone wrong. All right, well, I think we're gonna leave it there. I wanna thank both Jeremy and Mike for uh, teaching me a lot tonight. Thank all of you for your great questions uh, and for coming out tonight. Thank Evo and the Chicago Council. Thank Freedom House uh, for a great event. And we thank you. And get your report. <laughs>